little shopping channel. Has this ever happened to you? Are you tired of writing boilerplate code to load configurations? Have you ever had errors because of bad configuration values? Then this talk is for you. Uh, so, uh, very happy to welcome Victor, who has uh, joined us from London today. Uh, he works at Ovo Energy and uh, uh, he's going to talk about uh, fixing uh, uh, how the way we uh, load and work with configuration, namely uh, by using refined types. And um, I think without further ado, please welcome Victor. Thank you. Uh, as Lars said, my name is Victor, and I'm here today to talk to you about configurations, and more specifically, how we can use refined types to make sure our configurations are valid. Before we begin, uh, I'd like to say that I work for a green energy company in London called Ovo Energy. Uh, if you're interested in what we're to check out what we're doing, do that online, or come grab me later, and we can have a chat. I'd also like to say that this talk has been compiled using TUT, which I think is an excellent way to make sure that your code examples and your documentation works uh, whenever you make new changes. Uh, so here I'm just showing you like the complete list of imports that I won't bother showing you later on in the presentation. Um, so I can't recommend TUT highly enough, so please do use it. I'm not sure how we did documentation before that, really. So I guess it kind of makes sense to start by talking why we even need configurations at all. Why, why am I even here today talking to you about configurations? So the way I see it is there are three main use cases for configurations. One is to be able to use the same binary in multiple environments. You typically have like a local testing production environment and you want to use the same application but with different settings, right? Uh, another one is to avoid to recompile your uh, application whenever your setting change. So depending on what your environment you're in, you might have see more difficulties in making changes to your software and getting that deployed to production. Whereas if you're working in like environment where that's easy, that might not be such a great challenge. Also, Scala compile times are known to be quite long sometimes, so this might be a, a benefit, right? And third, and maybe the most important one, is that we want to keep secrets outside of our source code, outside of version control, because the source code can easily get into anyone's hands, right? So I'm not sure this sounds very exciting to you, but the kind of bottom line here is that all of this is typically necessary in most applications we write today. And I guess the kind of alternative title for this talk um, relating to that is, what are some of the difficulties dealing with configurations and what can we do about them. Now most of you probably do configurations together with configuration files. So let's spend a short time so you talk about configuration files as well. Whether you thought about it or not, the main reason to use configuration files is to be able to change settings without recompiling. One of those use cases I just showed you before. Typically then you would deal you would have a configuration library that helps you deal with those files. So that would help you load and override values from environment variables, for example. It would help you reuse different parts of your configuration in other parts. It would help you load these files uh, from different sources, whether it be files or URIs. And it would help you to do type conversions. You don't have to work with strings everywhere in your application, which is quite nice, right? So I guess it's fair to say that the most common uh, library for doing configurations in Scala today is type safe config. And I'm sure most of you have seen it before. But just to show you a, sh a short example of how that can look like. So that from my experience, this is how a lot of people do configurations today. So typically you create a class that wraps the type safe config object and you define a few helpers which kind of pulls out keys from your configuration. And here I'm showing you below the kind of configuration file, except it's in code. This would like normally be placed outside of your source code. S uh, so here I'm just having a very short example with uh, maybe some HTTP service that has an API key for authorizing requests. It binds to a certain port and it communicates with other services using some timeout specified in seconds here. So apart from uh, that I'm declaring my configuration here and I'm declaring some getters which pretty much has like a one-to-one -one mapping against each other. I'm sure some of you can spot some other difficulties uh, with doing configurations in this way. 
So you can see I'm reading the API key from the environment here by specifying the API key environment variable. And when I try to access this during runtime, I actually get a runtime <coughs> exception because I defined those helpers as defs and I forget, forgot to specify the API key environment variable when I compile this presentation. Another thing that's not so good here is that it's very much possible to define values which doesn't really make sense in our domain. So you can see I can specify an empty API key, I can specify negative uh, timeout, and I accidentally put a default system port here, which on Unix systems requires sudo permissions. So already from this short example, you can see there are some difficulties with the way we deal with configurations. So let's just recap those difficulties very quickly. So as you saw, we often have to write a lot of boilerplate code to deal with configurations. And because we do that, I typically find it that it's quite tedious to test this and therefore rarely gets tested. Even more rare is to deal with validation. So when we load values, we typically don't validate that those values make sense in our domain and that there are values that we can actually use in our application. And mistakes can lead to disastrous results. As we just saw from that short example, uh, maybe we didn't access that API key until we actually got our first request coming in, and at that point, our service just shuts down, right? So it's kind of a worst case scenario. So if we try and take that list of difficulties, and let's try and turn that into a wish list instead. If I could say, this is how I want configurations to be like, how would that look like? So my personal wish list would be that I have no boilerplate for declaring or loading configurations. I would ideally like them to be validated at compile time or at startup because not everything can be validated at compile time, right? Um, I ideally like validation to be encoded as part of the types. So I have that like static guarantee that whenever I pass values around in my application, I know what requirements have been asserted on those values. And I'm going to make a hard requirement here that I never want secrets to touch any persistent storage. <coughs> so when my application starts up, it's provided the values it needs, and when it shuts down, there's no, um, you can't find those secrets anywhere except in memory. So that's great. Let's try and walk these through and see how we can kind of uh, put this into practice. So if you're using type safe config today, a great way to just start by eliminating the boilerplate. And there are several libraries out there that can help you with that. And the one I'm going to talk about today is uh, Pure Config. So Pure Config is a great little library. Um, and what I've done here is I've just taken that settings class you saw and I've converted it into a case class, a pretty much straightforward translation. And what Pure Config does is uses macros from Shapeless to actually look at your case class and generate uh, configuration loading code based on conventions, basically your names and your types. So here I'm just uh, loading that small settings class and you can see already that uh, it kind of works, but it tells me there was no API key, uh, gives me an either instance back. And it also deals with error accumulation, so if you have multiple errors, you'll see them all here. So that, that's pretty neat already. Uh, we already eliminated most of the boilerplate, but just like we saw before, there are still, it's still very much possible to load invalid values, right? We can still load an empty API key, I can still load negative timeout, and I can still load a system port, for example. So what we'd like to do now is to somehow make sure that these values uh, don't get loaded and our application doesn't run with them. So one way we can encode validation and do that in our types is to use another little library called Refine. So Refine works on a very simple idea that you have a base type and you basically say, I want to refine that base type with a predicate, basically apply a filter to it. So here, I'm, here are just some refinement types. So for example, you can define a non-empty string by saying string refine non-empty, which means all the string values which are not empty. Very straightforward, right? Or I can define a pos int, which is int refined positive, meaning all integer values that are gra greater than zero. <coughs> so here uh, you can see that settings class from the previous slide, and I'm just changing the types here. So the API key is non-empty string, timeout is a pos int, 
and for the court I'm saying it has to be greater than 1023. And you can see this like w.t here, that's actually a shapeless uh, witness. So that's a way to encode, to do literal based singleton types. Uh, so it's kind of encoding values on a type level. And if you don't know about it, you don't really have to understand how it works or anything like that. Just know that this is a way to kind of represent values at the type level. And thanks to a very small integration between pure config and refine, we don't really have to do anything here more than uh, import that I showed you earlier on. And pure config kind of knows how to load this. So if you take a look at the settings once again, you'll see that we still could not find that API key from before. But now we get another error saying, yeah, you tried to load the HTTP port, but you gave me 989 and that's not greater than 1023, so that doesn't really work. <coughs> So that's a quite neat way to encode validation and we don't really have to write any other code. We just change our types and that kind of works quite nicely. Now we refine you can really take it as far as you like. And I'm sure some of you already think that port numbers are actually values between zero and 65,535, right? So you can define the closed interval with refine. You can say I want a non-system port number, which gives you like a stricter subset. Now, some of you might be thinking, what if uh, I, I run my application somewhere and I'm not sure if this port is going to be open. Maybe some other service is already listening to it. What if I really want to make sure that that port is open? And of course you can do that with Refine as well, but you kind of have to relax the requirement that you use pure functions, right? To check if a port is open, we actually have to try and bind that port. So it's really easy to define your own refinement types using refine. Uh, here I'm just defining an empty case class and I'm defining a instance of the validate type class. So here I'm saying I can check whether an int is an open port. And the way I do that is by creating a new server socket, essentially binding the port and then immediately closing that socket. And that validate from partial that you see is basically just wrapping that in a try instance. And then I can try that out on some values. So here I'm trying uh, 989, it tells me permission denied, that's a system port. I try it on 10,000, that seems to work. And I try it on some uh, value greater than that maximum limit you saw and I get a port value out of range. So I'm not saying you should necessarily do this in your applications, but I'm just showing you that you can really take it as far as you like and create their, their refinement types that make sense in your domain. Now naturally, as you, some of you might be aware, when we deal with impure function, that usually means you have to be a bit careful. So one of the really nice uh, features with Refine is that you get compile time validation using macros. So if you actually put values inside your Scala code and you compile that, you'll actually see that Refine tries to make sure that those values conform to the predicate you specified. But in this case, when I'm using the open port predicate, you'll see we actually do that open port check at compile time, which might not really be what you want. Uh, in this case, it's probably a good idea because we never really want a system port in, uh, as default here, but in some cases, that's probably not what you want. So as usual, uh, you need to be a bit careful. Now, while I was doing this presentation, I had this nagging question in my head. Um, and the question was, can we improve compile time safety somehow? So configuration files does make sense if you're in an environment where it's hard to change your application and it's hard to get those changes pushed through, uh, pr to production, or if you're suffering from really slow compile times. But what about if you could just write your configurations in Scala instead? It already does all the compile time checking for you. And if you can just like deploy several times per day, like if you're in a continuous deployment environment, for example, uh, then do you really need to use configuration files? Couldn't you just do that in Scala instead? So since we have that hard requirement that I don't want secrets to um, be in our source code, that means we have two options to deal with that, right? So either we store that configuration code somewhere else, for example, on some server that's gonna run the application, uh, that might be viable, uh, but depending on how hard requirement you have on secrets never stored to disk, 
that might not really be feasible. Also, if you're like me, I kind of like having all my source code in one repo, and uh, that's like everything there is to it. And the alternative to that is we write everything in Scala except the bits that can't reside in source code or needs to be dynamic for some reason, and we load that from the environment whenever the application runs, like ideally at startup, right? So let's just take a look at a pure Scala configuration, right? The minimum I could think of is basically this, pretty much what I uh, showed you earlier, except I swapped out that open port to a non-system port. And th this, is, this is great, right? If, if you're working in a single environment, you never need to change your settings and you don't have any secrets. In this case, we probably see that the API key is probably somewhat secret already, so maybe this is not really viable, right? So when we need to load values from the environment, there are a few things we need to think about. And typically, there are, we need to deal with uh, different configuration sources, so maybe loading from environment variables, system properties, something like maybe cred stash, or some other type of vault services. Uh, we need to convert from string to whatever different types we need. Uh, while we do that, we need to handle errors and ideally also accumulate them. And someone we need to manage being in different environments. And I'd also I do like to integrate with libraries like Refine so we can use that stuff I just showed you earlier. So this is something that a configuration library normally would deal with for you. And um, as I was doing this presentation, I couldn't really find a nice way to do, th do this already. So I actually wrote my own library uh, to do just that. Um, and it's called Siris, uh, which is a shortening of the word configurations, or an acronym. And you can find it at sir.is. Um, please check it out. So what is Siris about? Um, Siris is, is based on the idea that you put as much as possible of your configuration inside Scala. You load only the absolute minimum necessary values from your environment, like the secrets, like what environment you're in, for example. You then encode validation by using appropriate data types. So Sirius actually forces you to think about your types. If you say you want a string, you'll get a string. If you say you want a non-empty string, you'll get a non-empty string. So it kind of forces you to think about your domain a little bit. It deals with all that error handling and error accumulation you saw from before, so you don't have to think too much about that. Uh, it supports loading values from different sources, uh, hopefully whatever source you need. Uh, it's dependency-free at its core, and it provides modules for integrations with like refined and things uh, like that. So let's take a look at loading that same configuration you saw from before, and let's take a look at how that looks like in Sirius. So here I'm just importing Sirius and the Sirius refine module, and I'm saying load config, and I'm saying I want to read a non-empty string from the API key environment variable, and I want to read a non-system port number from hd.port. And that basically gives me a function with uh, those two parameters, and I can basically do whatever I want there. You see here that I'm hard coding the timeout, which never really need to change. Um, so that's kind of the hard coding part of it. And that basically gives you an either instance back, and you can do uh, whatever you want with that. So if we take a look at the error messages on the left side, you see I forgot to specify both the API key and port when I compiled this presentation. So some of you probably recognize this as like validated from cats with an, an apply instance, which is basically what it is, except we're not relying on cats here. So I said one of the major use cases for configuration was dealing with multiple environments. So how can you do that in series? There are a few different ways. Uh, one of my favorite ways is to use enumerations for that. And Sirius provides an integration with enumeratum. So I'm just showing you the minimum enumeration I could think of, think of at the time. So I'm just finding the different environments the application can run in. So local testing production. And then we can ask Sirius to load that configuration for us. And here we're just importing that configuration and the series and the module. And I'm saying I want to re optionally read an app environment from the app and, app and environment variable. And if you forgot to specify it or it's local, let's just use defaults for everything. 
if you specified something else, then let's just read the API key and port from the environment and uh, put the timeout to some other value. And when I uh, look at this here, I didn't specify anything when I compile this, so I'll just get the uh, default local configuration. So this is something I find is quite difficult to do with configuration files, but here you actually get the flexibility to um, do that um, e more easily. So there are two more modules i like to show you that series supports. One is a generic module uh, using shapeless. So it helps you load unary products and co-products, not unary co-products, but co-products. Um, so here I'm just importing series generic and I'm defining a system port number, just as a slightly contrived example. And I'm just saying that port is either a non-system port or a system port and series kind of knows how to load that um, for you. Also works with value classes and everything else that shapeless generic supports, thanks to Miles. Uh, so um, that's very neat. And one final integration is with uh, Squants. So Squants is a really nice library for quantities and unit of measure and dimensional analysis. So here I'm just defining a configuration source using a static map and I'm defining some power value, which is in kilowatts and an area that's in square kilometers. And just by importing series quants, we'll see that uh, series can import uh, or load values of, um, of those types. So that's pretty much um, series and most of what I had to show you. Uh, one recommendation I would like to make is to put something I call a try script in your uh, repos. A few libraries already do this, but I think it's a great way to kind of try out libraries. So basically, if you download the script to try.series, it um, grabs cores here, and it downloads the Ammonite REPL with the series modules and imports that for you. So you can start and, and have a play with it. And here you can see I'm just loading some seconds and minute values, and yeah, I'm adding those together and converting that to hours using Squants. So I think it's a great way to kind of try out libraries. Um, I hope you agree and that if you're a library offer, just put a try script uh, for your libraries. So that's most of what I had to show you. Uh, I'm just quickly gonna recap with a summary. So uh, in my experience, configurations are typically something that's associated with writing a lot of boilerplate code, making mistakes, not really writing any tests, not enforcing any kind of validation. I think if you're writing uh, configurations with type safe config today, you can use a library like pure config to help you eliminate the boilerplate code. Uh, you can use a library like refined to encode validations in your data types and pure config and refined kind of works together. If you're in an environment where it's easy to make changes to your application and get that application pushed through to production and if you can live with the Scala compile times then a great way to improve compile time safety is to write your configurations directly in Scala. And Cirrus is a small library helping you to do just that. I hope you find it useful. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Sure. Um, uh, the, the problem of, of dealing with configuration looks very much to me just like a straightforward, uh, I mean, you, like a case class thing, like your HTTP settings, and then the usual thing of marshalling and unmarshalling, uh, like you might do with a monadic thing like, like Cersei or Argonaut or, or whatever thing. I, I don't think I really understand what the uh, special thing is about configuration that means it needs all this extra stuff. Um, could, could you sort of uh, illustrate that? I think uh, it, it's not really a very special use case, but it's something that, in my experience, a lot of people get wrong. Like, it's an area where we typically spend not that much time at all. It's something that we find pretty boring, and that's a lot of people just gloss over. So I think my intention with just writing a small library to do this is to like 
focus people on like actually thinking about their configurations. So there are tons of different ways you can solve this, probably with Cersei or something different. It all depends on like your your needs. But it, this was more to kind of direct attention to think configurations and thinking more about them. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so it's it's more of a comment rather than a question because um, I really like it because we had the same realization a, a few months ago that we are shipping systems in production with configuration files that we actually never change. And we thought, why don't we just use Scala case classes? And this is just the additional validation that we needed on top of that, so that's really great. But do you, do you see other um, systems right now where people really change their configuration files? Um, in my short-lived professional experience, I've never seen that. Okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're next, Miles. <laughs> Pick for something. Um, okay, great. Um, I, I, like, I like the talk. Um, one, one reason being that I have been doing this for years and I, I absolutely endorse this as a, uh, I don't want to say the correct way to do configuration, but it's certainly a good way. Um, one additional reason uh, is that often configurations have um, different places where you can define them. Some, some, some people like to have, uh, or some libraries allow you to define a configuration on the class path. Some expect it through uh, command line, Java, Java command line parameters, uh, others environment variables. And you don't know where, at least from a programmer's point of view, who's focused on, uh, on the language, on Scala, on, uh, with only the, the, the tools available for debugging Scala, you really don't know where the configuration is coming from. And you can often waste a huge amount of time trying to work it out. Uh, same for logging. Um, so having it in code makes it very unambiguous as to where the uh, where, where the configuration is coming from. So it's just a, just a comment rather than a question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I have a follow-up question before that. Um, well, in, in, in fact, in, in, in Unix-based systems, it's, it's actually pretty common to have like a, um, um, a configuration that has been put there by your package vendor, like an etc something, uh, and then you may specify in a command line in, in a user config, or it is in, in dot .local somewhere, and then a command line parameters. So what would you recommend there if, if you have a scenario like that? Um, I'm not sure you can escape from the configuration files in that case. Um, I still think a lot of what I said kind of applies to those use cases if you really have to load configurations files. I think that series or similar alternatives is more a complement. It kind of depends on what context you're dealing with. So I mean, if you really have to use configuration files and you kind of think series is a quite neat way of dealing with that, you could probably write something that reads values out of that config and it kind of works with series. So the idea is we can potentially support any configuration source you can think of. But it really depends a bit on, on your context, I would say. Uh, just quickly, it is permissible to ask questions if you're not on the front row. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a question. <laughs> so a, a, a really daft question. Um, have you, g g okay, we want, we want, configuration in code sounds, sounds great. Um, um, we do have a problem with, with secrets. So, what, have you have you considered um, an SBT plugin that decrypts encrypted source code uh, transiently prior to compiling? Would that uh, be a complete daft idea? Um, it's a good question. I think um, it's kind of hard to fulfill the requirement of secrets never touching persistent storage, though. Um, so the idea is that you you have your application. There's absolutely no trace of any secrets, and when it kind of boots up it either fetches them or somehow gets provided with them. And at some point, if your application ever shuts down, there's absolutely no trace of that secret anywhere except in memory or wherever it came from originally. So it's probably viable, but yeah, not for that requirement. Uh, how does your library support um, loading configurations for different environments like development uh, so, I kind of showed that just recently, but the idea is basically you write 
well, I'll show you the slide probably, it's easier to talk about that. So this is kind of my idea of how you deal with multiple environments. So the idea is you write everything in one application and then you have some value that basically decides what environment you're in. So here we're loading values of an enumeration from enumeratum, but this could just as well be a string, right, if you really wanted to. Um, so that's actually what this does, does. so app environment maps a string to your enumeration. So if I say uh, local, just like it's written here, local with an uppercase L, it'll tell me, okay, I'm in a local environment. Or if I say testing or production, it'll actually be that environment, and then you can do whatever you please. Yeah, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so I'm really bad at typing. So when I write configuration files, I make typos all the time. And then sometimes I spend hours pulling my hand, you know, why is my configuration option ignored? Uh, and then I realize, oh, I typed it wrong and there was a default. So that's what it was using. And I was wondering if there's any ideas you have on how to solve that problem. Like maybe, you know, some warning that says, uh, okay, you've used a configuration uh, key here that doesn't actually exist. Um, yeah. Uh, if you're writing your configurations just like files, uh, I mean a great way to uh, kind of deal with that is just like try and load your configurations in your tests. So I mean you can't really do that at type level very easily, right? But you can very much just try and load your configuration and say, yeah, I should use default values for anything that's not overridden. Or you just say like, if I have my config and I say that these keys sh should have these values, then it should load successfully. So just do a basic test. Well, the, the idea was actually getting a warning for when there is an item in your configuration file that your program doesn't know about. Yeah. Do you think that would be possible? You mean you specify keys that are not... Um, right, I just mistype HTTP yeah. port, I don't know, I use a double O or whatever, and yeah, so it tell me, hey, I don't know that configuration yeah. key. So if you use pure config, it actually does that for you. So. Uh, there are some customizations you can do apart from the naming convention. You can also say if there are any keys that are not in what pure config will load, then give me a warning. Oh, okay, thanks. So you can do that. Okay, so we have time for one more quick question. Um, Just about this example, uh, can you integrate also with the command line arguments? Easily? Yeah, I was just thinking about that when someone mentioned command line arguments. Okay, great, so probably yeah. Yeah, a good, good next integration. Okay, uh, then let's thank the speaker for the talk. Thank you.